So welcome to the advanced scripting techniques module. And we're really just gonna build on what we was doing in the introduction to scripting module. We're gonna look a little bit more about how we can pass data to scripts, how I can return data, really enabling better reuse of the scripts I do, and a touch on some of the debugging, the um, signing of our scripts. Now, in the previous script examples in the previous module, I kind of passed parameters, but I don't actually have to define the parameters if I want to be lazy. Arguments can be passed to a script without any kind of definitions in the script itself, and they're actually captured into these default variables. Now, it is better to use named parameters. It gives me more control. I can type them in terms of casting them to a certain type of data. I can say if they're mandatory, but I don't have to. Here's a script that just accesses the built-in variables. I can get a list of the number of arguments and I can output what they are. So here's that sample script. It's just the mod five script one. And if I was to just go into the assets folder, and if I run mod five script one, and I can say, hello world, how's it going? And it says, well, look, there were five arguments. They were hello world, how's it and going? Obviously, I can't make people enter five. I can't treat them any differently. It's all based on their position when I enter them, which can be a weakness. But for a very simple script, realize, well, I could do exactly this. I could just access based on the args built in set of variables. You'll notice what it does, it creates an array, args, as in arguments, and then I'm using a for each. So for each argument in the array of arguments, I'm just writing it out. And I'm just using the length attribute of the array to tell me how many arguments there were. It's really kind of that simple. Now, there are actually different types of parameter with PowerShell. I can think about switches. With a switch, it's really just it's there or it's not. So this is a good example of where I want to recursively look at a folder. I can specify recurse and it will go and look through the subfolders. If it's not there, then it doesn't. I can have options. So this is where I would actually have to put the option name as the parameter and then some value. So filter star.txt. Or it can be a positional parameter. I, I don't have to actually specify the name. I can just put star.txt. And based on its position, it's going to utilize that. And I can use multiple parameters. Simply add in multiple parameters and a variable name, and it's going to utilize those. Now, I do have implicit positions. So based on the order in which I actually put in the parameters in my script, well, I can just pass the data to it in that order. And providing I do it in the right order, it's going to work. I could also use the actual parameter names. So here's a super, super simple script. So if I jump over and I don't actually think I have this one saved because it's so simple. That's a kind of a more advanced version. That's kind of the next step to this. But actually this will do for now. Kind of ignore the position part of this or the mandatory. And so if I just run mod five script two, I can say, hello world. Great. I could also say, well, world, hello. It doesn't know any better. But if I said the name, 
because the name is the name of the variable I'm putting it into. So that's also the parameter name. And then I said the greeting. Let's do something strange on my cursor. Let's try that again. So if I here did well, the name is world and the greeting was hello, well then it works. So I'm actually then specifying exactly which parameter is which. I'm not relying just on the positional element of that. I can explicitly define the positions, which is that script I was showing there which means the order I put it in the parameters list of my script doesn't have to actually match the order I want them to be able to put it when they just type it in. Now, once I use an explicit positional, then any without a position must be entered by name. So if I had two with a position and then a third that didn't have a position, I can't just put that in third. It just won't work. I have to specify explicitly by its name. So here's a kind of example of using that. And that's the script we have over here. You can see it saying, well, my parameter, I actually have name first, which is actually the second one we want to enter. However, it's been coded to be position number two. And then the greeting, I hello or hi or bonjour, whatever. Well, that's position one. And that's why it worked when we just did hey, hello world, even though greeting is actually the second one in order of the script, it's been told it's position one. So I can do hello world and it works because I've got that explicit definition of the parameter. I can use different names. So I can actually alias the parameter names. Now, I can use the original name as well. So this time I could have the same script, but I'm actually adding in now an alias for friend for the name parameter. So I could actually use either one of those. So if we go back to our script, and what I'm gonna add in here is we have our name here. We have a mandatory true and our position. I'm just gonna add in alias. So another name for an alias of friend. I'm adding for name. So now if I run this script, oh yep, it's gonna run exactly as it did before. I could also put in name and it still works. But I can also put in friend. And what I need to do is actually save the script. That always helps. So now if I run that again, it works. But actually that's a great point and I'll pretend I did that on purpose because that shows you what it didn't work before I had that alias in there. And then once I went ahead and added it, well then, I can actually use that new alternate name. So it's a good way in my scripts, if I wanna be able to maybe have like a short version or just different names for something, I can add in those aliases. I can also use switches. Now these are essentially set to true or false. There's no additional value. If the switch is present, then it's true. If it's not passed, then its value is false. So here I have a number of parameters. I can pass, for example, the list of computer names, the array of computer names. But now I have a switch called show logical processors. And if we just jump over to this script, so this is gonna be our mod five script three. It's very similar to one we used in the previous module. I'm passing in a computer name but it's actually not an array anymore. We've simplified this back to just one name in this script because what we don't have is kind of the square brackets there showing, hey, look, it's actually an array. I can pass multiple ones. But I also have this switch show logical processors. 
So if I was to run this script just on its own, so if I run mod5 script three, and we'll put in a machine name, It's showing me my number of processors is one. Now if I run it again, and notice I can do tab completion. How cool is that? I'm running the script. It's enumerating the parameters and it lets me do tab complete based on the various names. Likewise, I can do tab complete for all the other things. I've obviously got um, the computer names in there already. If I run it now, I get a different output. I get number of logical processors because it's checking, do I have show log prox to true? If it's true, output out the number of logical processors, else I it's not true, output the number of processors, i.e. the physical processors. So that's what parameters can do, these switches, and they're kind of super powerful. They're super easy, and they can really change the way my script works. Now I can also accept input from the pipeline. Now there's two things I have to have. I have to add this new part in the beginning, commandlet binding. And then I have to add in this value from pipeline equals true. Now when I'm doing that, if I'm doing this pipeline, I can remember do by name or by value. So if I'm doing it by property name, then the name coming in would have to match the name of this kind of parameter. So let's take an example of doing this. So we're going to exit this for a second. And we're going to jump over now to kind of uh, our bigger example of this comp info.ps1. Now we're going to keep building on this. So this has got some additional code in. But you can see I've got this commandlet binding and we've got this value from the pipeline is true. And it's now once again going to accept an array of machines I can pass to it. So if I just ran ordinarily my comp info and I did sav azure us south central, it works. It runs these commands and gets me that information. But that's not using the pipeline. So it's expecting a string I, uh, by value. So it's expecting a string as the input. So as long as I send it a by value, i.e. a string, then this should work. So if I send it that same name, it works. So I can use that by value or by property name. In this case, I'm using by value. I'm sending it a string. It's expecting a string, so I'm good. So it's that easy to light up the pipeline for my script. I have to have this commandlet binding. And then I'm saying, yep, I'm going to accept value from the pipeline. So I'm starting to really start to now increase the capability of my script. What is the next thing we would expect from our script? Well, I want to enable help. We just put in a big comment section at the start of the file. So ordinarily to comment, we do the hash symbol. If we do the left arrow hash, that lets me comment out an entire block of code. So in this case, from the left hash to the hash right arrow, everything else is now just a comment. But there's a special format I can use like a synopsis, a description, parameters, examples that will then be interpreted by PowerShell as the help for that script. It would even let me now run get help on my script. So I jump over to my script. You see we have that. We have the angle bracket hash. Then we have a synopsis, a description, parameters. I have an example. I can have multiple examples. And I close it. And if I just jump over super quick to kind of prove this point, it's just like some regular PowerShell. Notice normally I use a single hash character to comment out a line. So I can comment out this line. If I do the left arrow hash, 
and then I close it, I comment out that section of code. So I've now commented out that entire block. But we don't want to do that. So I have in my comp info this help available. So I can now do get help on my script. And it shows me, hey, there's a name, there's my synopsis, shows me my syntax, which is generating automatically based on my parameters. And I have a description. Well, I can also show me an example. Oh, look, there's an example for my file. I can do full. Gives me my outputs, inputs, full the parameters, description, syntax. I'm lighting it up in the same way as a regular commandlet. Obviously, the quality of the help is only as good as the things I put in to this section of my code. And this help I can think of as people who want to use these scripts I'm writing. I might have functions in my scripts as well. And it also can be good for me because I often will write a script and I come back to it much later and I'm like, wait, what does this do? What do I need to put in here? So I can go back and look at my help and it will actually help me in the use of my script. Now, when it comes to troubleshooting my script, obviously debugging is super useful. And we kind of talked about that when we set up VS Code the idea that I can toggle breakpoints. So I can within my scripts, this is my script. I could say, well, I'm not quite sure what's being passed. So maybe I'm gonna kind of put a breakpoint here. So I'm F9 to toggle my breakpoints. I can always remember bring up the debug environment. I'll actually probably remove pizzas eaten because I'm not watching that anymore. And now I could actually say, well, yep, yeah, I want to kind of debug this thing. I can do debug, start debugging, push F5. So if we go there, so I can just in here, I'm going to push F5. Now remember, I want a parameter. So it's actually going to prompt me for that. So it's helping me out. So I can type in my parameter name. Push enter to end the entry because it's expecting an array. So say, okay, I don't want any more, I just push enter. And now I've hit the break. And this is where I can go and do my debugging. So I've got all the variables. It shows me my computer name. It shows me the array. Computers has one item, it's a length of one. Computer name has been populated using that first item in the array. If I were to watch something, I could kind of right click on it and say add to watch, so I'd see that as it changed, so I can see the values, I can see the stack of how things are being called. I can then progress and step through. So now we see I've got little icons to show me as well, so I can step over, step into, step out of. So if you wanna step through each kind of line, I can just do F10. If it's a function, I can push F11 to actually go into it. So I can run through the lines where it's getting that. And it's going to show me as kind of things pop up. So I've got all these new, there's my Win32, and I can actually go and dive into well, what are all the various elements of that. So it's great to actually drill down and see everything it's doing. So that's how I can really kind of debug. So I've got this pram out. So I could go and see, well, where's that? Oh, there it is, it's my hash table. It's got these various values in it. So I don't have to do anything, I don't have to do right output, right output to try and work out where I am. If I just do debugging, I can very quickly see exactly what's happening in the code, what's being called from what. And if I'm kind of done, I can just step out of and let it finish. So that's kind of very simple debugging. I'll turn off that breakpoint in Visual Studio Code. Now, there might be other times where, look, I'm not trying to debug it, but I maybe just want to sometimes get some extra information. I can do right verbose. So here, it won't show me the information unless I add dash verbose to the execution, 
providing I have that commandlet binding. Likewise, I can do write debug, and then that will only get shown if I add dash debug when I run things. I can also suspend things and look at the current state, then resume by typing exit. So there's some nice things that when I run with the debug I can do. So here's an example of using that and it's in this script. So you can see I have some lines where it's write debug. Hey look, it's finished querying. It's just some extra information about what's actually happening. Hey look, I'm querying this computer. Hey look, I finished querying this computer. So I can see kind of exactly what's going on. So if we run this script again, No idea what all that is. So if we just do dot slash comp info, we'll pass it a name and this time we'll add verbose. And you can see, oh, it's still that break. Let's just um, step out, just continue, and it finished. But we saw we got these extra queries happening here. So you can see, hey look, I was querying that machine. I've actually got more verbose information going on as part of the commandlets themselves. And then I actually get my information. So we'll come out of that. So if we just run that one more time, so now that that debug's gone, so we can see it just finishes. And I can see I just get the extra information coming through here. So just a good way to see a little bit more about exactly kind of what's going on within the scripts I have. Now you'll also notice I have a write debug. So if I was to instead of verbose, do dash debug, When it hits that point, that's where, hey look, I could have suspended, I could have checked other things. I just said continue, and it output the debug line. So right verbose is, hey, it's giving me information to the screen. Right debug also lets me then at that point, not only show me information, but maybe decide to interact with it in different ways. Now things will go wrong. And it's very hard to anticipate every error. Many commandlets have got good things to actually try and catch things and handle them themselves. But I can actually have something called a try and a catch. So what this enables me to do is I can actually define what I want to happen when there's a problem. So I can try and run, hey, this get WMI object, if there's an error, stop and then I can actually catch it and I can control what I do next. For example, hey, I'm gonna output the error and I say looking good is false. And then I can say, well, only do this if I'm looking good. If I'm not looking good, well, I'm not gonna do it. It's a way that I can know if we have an error or not. So if you actually look at the code over here, we do exactly that. We try to connect to this computer and get the information. And if there's an error, we're gonna stop. Then there are things like continue, silently continue. In fact, if I delete that, there we go. I'm doing control space. And I can see continue, ignore, inquire, silently continue, stop, suspend. So I'm picking stop. So yeah, that control plus space shows the IntelliSense. So that can be kind of nice thing um, to actually check, well, what can I do here? So if we run this, and this time, we'll put a machine that doesn't exist. And notice how it's saying something bad. WinOM cannot process. So that was my string, something bad and then dollar underscore is the error I get returned. Now, if I did not have this, if I did not have this try catch, 
it would just bleed all over my screen. You get that big red text, lots of different things. I kind of lose control potentially. This way I can decide exactly what I want to do. So I say, if looking good, I would have continued. Else, hey, I failed for this computer name, which is the message I got out. Now, instead of doing my output here, I could have done write error. So now if I run that again, I get a more kind of jarring, oh look, something's happening here. So that's how we can use kind of the right warnings, right errors, etc., to get that different interaction for the person executing. The recommendation would be you always want to try and handle errors within your code. You really don't just want something to fail and crash and then you're not sure what happens. So good code and I'm guilty of this. If you look at a lot of these samples, I'm not doing try catch. These are kind of quick things to show principles of things, not to create a perfect script. But if I'm ever doing something that might fail, well, I, I probably want to try this action. If I'm connecting to a remote machine, I don't know is there. Well, I should probably try it and then catch and handle it in a neat way because that's going to then impact the rest of my script. For example, I wouldn't want to try and connect to Azure and not catch if it failed and then just output another 100 lines of script failing trying to create a resource group and create a network adapter and create a VM. No, I should try and connect. If the connect fails, say, hey, look, couldn't connect, uh, exiting. If I can connect, then I will try and continue. And maybe, hey, look, I try and create a new resource group. And then if that fails, say, hey, I don't have the right permissions or whatever, and not then try and create a bunch of resources in a resource group that failed to get created. So think very logically about what we're trying to do. But this is all good. So we've created a script that I can get some computer information. What about creating my own module? And it's actually super easy. If I save a file as a PSM1 instead of PS1, it makes it a PowerShell script module. And there are different places I can save it. I can save it kind of in my documents. There's a Windows PowerShell modules, and then I want a folder name the same as the name of the PSM1 file. For example, if my PSM1 module that module was comp info, the folder name would be comp info as well. So if I go and look over in my folder, if I go and look at my documents, I have my PowerShell folder. Sometimes it's Windows PowerShell, sometimes it's PowerShell. They changed it in different versions of Windows. If I go into my PowerShell folder, I see a modules folder. In my modules folder, I've created a folder called comp info. And in comp info, I have a file called comp info.psm1. Now, there are other places I could put those as well. If I go ahead and look at something called ps module path, ps module path, there it works. Don't forget dollar env, because um, so I'm looking at environment variable. You can see these are the places it's looking. So it's looking under, well, there's my user account, PowerShell modules. It's also looking under C program files, PowerShell modules. It's also looking under PowerShell 6 modules. And I'm even looking in kind of the Windows System 32, Windows PowerShell V1 modules, I'm looking under VS Code extensions. So if I created a folder under any of those, and then put my PSM1 file in it, it would also work. So if it was more of a system level, well, maybe I'd go and put it under C program files, PowerShell modules. And if we actually go and look at that, you can see all the different modules I've installed, really Azure. So I've installed the Azure AD module and the Azure module. So it creates a folder for each of its various modules. And these are actually binaries. You can see, hey, look, I've got this azaccounts.psm1 in the AZ accounts folder, so I have different versions as well. But for me as a user, creating something just I'm using, it would go in my local folder. Now, there is some weirdness with PSM module path right now. I'm gonna talk about a bit more of that in a second, but it's about PowerShell Core and Windows PowerShell don't exactly share the same module path. For example, there's a system environment variable I can modify. 
and that's used by Windows PowerShell, but today it's kind of ignored by PowerShell Core, which will just go and create its own. And that's deliberate. There's a whole set of conversations about this, but just be aware uh, they do behave a little differently. But those default ones, you can always go and check by looking at that $ENV PS module path. They're the things it's gonna use. There's always gonna be one pointing to your local documents, PowerShell modules. There's always gonna be one pointing to that kind of C program files modules under there as well. You can always just go and check and see, hey, look, what's going on? This can be good to work out. Where's this module coming from? Where is it finding this thing? So is this set when PowerShell starts with the document subfolder added automatically? Now that PS module path, it is a system environment variable that can be changed. If you look at the variable, you see the documents added. You can add your own static ones, but it does not get inherited by PowerShell core today. It's just Windows PowerShell. There's a whole set of discussions. There's a whole um, discussion going on right now about what is the right behavior. Should there be a separate PowerShell core version of this environment variable? So just realize if I go and set this environment variable over here, so the PS module path, and let's say I add something to that, you can see all these different paths in it, including your documents one, this will not get picked up by PowerShell core. If I manually edit this system environment variable and add things to it, that will not get used by PowerShell core. So just important to kind of understand that and know they do behave differently today. It's in flux, but for right now, think of those default ones that I could create environments where I could add things to that on startup, but I'm not gonna get things from that environment variable. If you're really interested, let me just open this up for a second. So if we jump over to a web browser, obviously PowerShell Core is open source. You can go and see the source code. And so people have actually commented, hey look, Windows PowerShell uses the environment variable, PowerShell Core is ignoring it. And people are actually posting comments on this. And you actually see Microsoft respond. There's explicit code clearing the variable. You can actually go and see the source code that's doing it. And there's a whole set of discussion here about what should it do. So it's actually interesting. But that's what's so cool about PowerShell Core. I can actually go and look at the source code. Hey, it's behaving this way. Oh, look, let's go look at the source. Oh, yeah, look, it's been cleared deliberately because there might be different compatibilities between the different modules, so we don't necessarily want to just take the module path from Windows PowerShell. And so should they have core and desktop? That's being discussed. But just be aware of that. It's important if you're using PowerShell core that it's gonna behave differently. Now, I talked about functions before. I showed you an example in a previous module. They're just bits of code that can be called elsewhere in the code. I can accept input and output. I can have parameters. I can use args just like a script. There's a default dollar import for all the data that's sent to it. And anything sent to output is returned from the function. Remember, don't use write host. I just wanna use, for example, write output. I don't even have to explicitly say write output. If I just have something coming out of it at the end of the pipeline, that's the output from the function. So here's a kind of super simple example of that. Hey look, I'm creating a function called first three. I can send it input, and then I can send that input to other stuff. So if we quickly jumped over, so if we just create that function quickly, so if I paste in that little line and then execute get process, passing it to that function, I just get the first three. It's that simple. I can create a function kind of that quickly. And I believe, if we actually jump over, if we go to our sample file, our advanced scripting. Oh, I actually don't have that in the example. So that's my bad. 
So I will actually add that in super quick and I'll update that to GitHub. So there we have kind of that example piece of code in there. So that's a function, really, really easy. Well, I can make my script a function. I embed all the code and I call them squiggly brackets. I actually learned today for the first thing that I say brackets a lot. And I guess in America, a bracket is the square bracket, whereas a regular bracket you call parentheses. So I've been saying that wrong apparently for 14, nearly 15 years. So my bad, in England, we just call regular brackets brackets, whereas you call them parentheses and we call what you call brackets square brackets. So a useful thing for me to know being in the computer world for 15 years in America. Anyway, so I can quickly change my script into a function by just putting a function call around it and then the squiggly brackets. So at this point, if we actually jump over into our assets, we can actually see there's a comp info file and there's our module version, compinfo.psm1. So I'm going to close that down. Let's look at this file. So we can see, hey, look, I've got exactly that. I've just got function, get, compinfo. So now we want to use legal verbs. I'm not just going to make up a verb. I'm not going to say gimme compinfo. There are legal verbs that I should be using. You can go and search for this and actually find what they are. If I quickly jump over again to the web browser, we paste this in approved verbs for Windows PowerShell commands. So Microsoft has a whole document with the verbs you're allowed to use and when you should use which one. So retrieves a resource, uh, get. So that sounds like what I wanna do. So I'm using get comp info. There's my standard help, it's the same script I had before. I'm still calling commandlet binding, I'm still having parameters. I'm not changing anything else. All I've done is put function, alias noun, squiggly bracket, and then I close it in a squiggly bracket. That's it. So I've put that PSM1 folder, sorry, file in a folder called the same, and then I would put that under my documents area. So we have it in our project. If we go to our assets, there's a comp info subfolder with the file. I would copy that under my documents, PowerShell, modules, create a folder called comp info or copy the folder over with my file inside it. And that's gonna behave exactly the same way. And I just call that out here. If I've saved it correctly, it's just gonna be available. So if I now come out of the assets folder, if I do get module list available, and it's scanning through all the folders in the path to find those modules. But drum roll, it's, it's right there. So you can see under C users John documents, I can see there's comp info. Get comp info. Now I created this while away, there's no metadata about is it core or desktop. But this will work on core. And then once that's finished, I'll actually be able to see that. So while that's carrying on, but I can see it's available. It found it and it's there. Notice I am using git sim instance, so this will work on core. So if I just now run get comp info, it works. Let's format that as a table and we'll auto size it. So that, that's it. We've created a module. That's all we had to do. We saved it as a PSM1 file and we put it in a folder and we put it in our PS module path. And since it's just for us, we did the one under our documents. There really was nothing more to it than that. Now, the final thing, I've got a whole bunch of just import as normal, autocomplete works, get help would work. It's just gonna behave as regular modules would. So here's the script. It's in the PowerPoint, but it's better just get it from the GitHub. 
Final point, signing our scripts. Now to sign a script, we have to have a certificate for code signing. Now you could go and buy this from a uh, internet trusted certificate provider. If you have an enterprise PKI, so if I open up my MMC, I've got one in my environment. That's where I got my code signing certificate from. So if I go and add in certificates and I look at my user account, well, what I have is a code signing certificate. So I can use that to sign scripts with. Now, if it's issued by your internal PKI, it also has to be trusted. It has to be under my kind of trusted publishers. And I'm with a company, I could push that with group policy, for example. That's gonna let me actually trust it for signing. So if I see something signed with that cert, if it's under trusted publishers, I'm gonna say, okay, yep, I, I trust that cert, I'm gonna trust that script. And actually signing a script is kind of super easy. So if you actually look here, it talks about where I can get it from. All I have to do is get the thumbprint, actually get my certificate, and then sign my script. So if I was to jump over, let's close our comp info, and I've got a sign me script, hello world, another world beta of a script. And I'm not actually running as an administrator. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open this up. This is running as administrator. We're gonna go to our users, me, documents, our class and our assets. So now I can see the sign me. So if I was to just run, sign me, it works. Now, if I set the execution policy to all signed, I can't run it anymore because it's not signed. Well, that's a bummer. So what I can do is, there's my script. So notice what it looks like. If we go back to our sample file, I've got the code in here, which gets me my first array item zero certificate that I can use for code signing. So I'm enumerating the certificate PS drive. I'm looking at the current user, i.e. me, and then my certificates. And I want all of them that I can use for code signing. So if I run that one line, well, I've got the cert. So if I look at the cert, oh, I should have to select down here. If I run the cert, well, there's my code signing cert. And now, if I run this command, it will sign my script. So my sign me script over here, I'm just gonna run this command. So I'm actually gonna copy it because I want you to see what happens. So there's the script. I'm gonna run this command. And boom, it's been signed. It has a signature block using that signature and there's the end of the signature block. I have now signed my script. So now if I try and run it again, da-da, I've now got a signed script. And I obviously don't wanna leave that execution policy in my environment, so I'm gonna set it back to remote signed only. But that's how I can sign scripts. I just need a code. Now I can create my own signing script just for testing. Um, there's make cert utilities out there. PowerShell can create a self-signed cert. If you have an enterprise PKI, ask them to create a certificate template for code signing, and then you can just go and request it from there. Then it will be trusted by my enterprise. And that's it. I mean, that's now I can create these um, signed scripts. I can sign my modules. I've created modules, I could publish them, I could share them. And they're making really, really reusable code. And that's kind of the key to what we want to do here. I, want, I don't wanna keep reinventing the wheel. I want to create code that I continually reuse. 
So next we're gonna look at parsing data and working with objects as always. Obviously I just made some changes. So I've changed the sample file, I changed the comp info. I'm gonna say, hey look, updates for module five. I'm gonna commit that. And I'm gonna go ahead and push that to the remote origin, the GitHub repository. And so now you can go ahead, if you did a refresh, and you say, look, there were some updates. If we look at our assets, we'll see, hey, look, there's the comp info file. There was a little update made to it. So you should want to go and up this frequently. If you're watching these videos as I'm creating them, I'm constantly updating the GitHub. So you want to go and pull down the new version. As always, I'll be adding the videos to the playlist. And again, you want to be watching them in order because it's just going to keep growing. Hope this was useful. Thanks for watching.